Okay, let's uh, get started on chapter 10, which is uh, on evolution and natural selection. Uh, I had already uh, posted to watch a video on uh, Darwin, and uh, that comes into really good play uh, for this particular uh, chapter. So I hope you've had a chance to look at that, and, uh, and I'll make reference to it as we uh, go through this uh, slide presentation. But what we're going to try to do uh, in the time that we have is to try to explain evolution and uh, about Darwin's journey. Uh, his power of observation is really, really good, and how he applied it uh, was really... Uh, it indicated how much he really enjoyed and loved nature and uh, like observing it, which is an important characteristic. We're going to talk about describing and explaining four different mechanisms that give rise to evolution and some other evidence uh, that there may be for that. Uh, so we're going to look at an example uh, evolution now obviously how long have you gone without food well that's a little bit difficult to uh, to say uh, 10 15 minutes uh, I don't know um, there are some diets for you they call a every other day starvation diet or something like that but what they did in this study is they looked at Drosophila melanogaster or fruit flies and they looked at the normal time that a, a fly could survive. It was, it's about 20 hours without food. And what they wanted to do, uh, to cut to the chase, is to see if they could, through um, selective pressure, uh, i.e. holding off food, if they could get some that could live longer than that. And through spontaneous mutation and the like, through evolution, uh, what they wanted to do is see if if they could and what they found was yes they had um, in generations 160 hours without food so here's an example of evolution uh, playing a, a key role now we're going to show this in the lab uh, we're going to do a, a uh, just a thought experiment uh, involving bacteria and looking for mutations and I'm going to talk about uh, one of the important things of uh, right now medically is resistance to antibiotics and th that could be a real problem it is actually because we have now resistance to everything but we'll talk about that when we get into the lab uh, part next week uh, so a fruit flies and uh, starvation shows that uh, we had uh, forced a mutation uh, out of the group and so the uh, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few in this case it's sort of a, a, a policy where uh, one organism uh, developed a certain characteristic and because there uh, was no food others couldn't survive and the one with the mutation did so you're selecting for that mutation and that's what's happening so the population is the number of organisms in the same species living uh, in the same geographical region. So and this experiment is easy to conduct. Obviously, we can uh, control those sorts of things. We removed or they removed the food and wait uh, until about 80% of the flies have starved to death. That sounds pretty cruel. Um, but then uh, they put the container in there and the surviving flies were allowed to reproduce and then they repeated and it's it's quite uh, uh, stark what they they found was of course uh, some of the population survived 160 hours now look at the this is how you propagate them in these little bottles and you put the little uh, a fabric top on it or a little stopper it keeps them uh, from leaving and the media and all that stuff so it's easy to to control and it's it's a perfect experiment i um, at state nc state if you take genetics there they still use drosophila uh, i remember uh, i had a batch of flies that i had to maintain and i did eye color and wings uh, deformations and things like that to show uh, 
the genetics of Drosophila. Really easy to do, and if you are headed for state in, in a science area, uh, it, it's actually pretty fun. Uh, so, what we're seeing here is evolution, and let me go ahead and add a, a kind of a modifier to it. This is microevolution. The, the generation time is so short in these uh, Drosophila that you can see evolution in a period of time. Now, if I were to take a bunch of students and starve them, no, I wouldn't do that. But you can see the generation time of humans is quite longer, and uh, that makes it a little bit harder to do a study. But, you know, with bacteria, generation time of 20 minutes, they, they double every 20 minutes. Well, Drosophila, uh, you're looking at hours, so uh, not too exciting. So evolution occurs is because the consequence of certain individuals in the population are born with certain genetic makeup or characteristics that now affords them some new characteristic. And if there's selection pressure or things in the environment that uh, uh, make it conducive for that particular in individual, the population now will, will take advantage of that uh, individual and allow it to propagate. And because it, it can outcompete the others, it will persist. And this is the sort of the changes that we see. And so, um, just a quick summary. Characteristics of individuals present in population can change. Now, the only reason this change occurs, of course, is because the DNA allows it. If the uh, replication and all the things that we've talked about in terms of maintenance of DNA was perfect, then there would be no uh, evolution because there would be no changes. But because there are some mistakes and changes, uh, we, we now can uh, actually observe uh, something we call evolution. And uh, this was best illustrated by Charles Darwin. And uh, if you haven't seen the movie yet, please do. Uh, it gives you a background on Charles Darwin. I took a course once uh, and history is, at the time, wasn't one of my favorite things when I was going through school. And I was kind of dreading taking the course. It was um, uh, British literature and uh, British history. And it was taught by Michael Wyatt. He was a retired commander of the United States Navy. <clears throat> he was one of the best professors I ever had. Uh, what he did was he focused on the individuals and what they were going through, their life struggles, and then what they did to contribute to the history. I never forgot that. And since then, uh, I, I've applied that sort of that uh, viewpoint of looking at the individual. It helps you remember the history. It helps you so much more. It puts music, it, it, it puts a person's face on the science and that's what I wanted to try to do here and the movie really does kind of emulate what Charles Darwin must have been like and I wanted to convey that because that's I just telling you that isn't going to really do much but the movie does help and I, I, I hope you look at it from that perspective so uh, Darwin uh, he was able to question some things and if you saw in the movie there was uh, and there's still there's always pressures, the political, uh, religious, various things. Uh, Copernicus, when he uh, uh, suggested, I guess is a good way to put it, that uh, the earth perhaps isn't the center of the universe, well, uh, the, the religious community wasn't too happy about that, and uh, he suffered consequences. So uh, when you hear Read about Copernicus if you're interested in history and science. Uh, some of these individuals went through quite uh, interesting challenges in their careers. Some of them were, were killed for their beliefs. And, um, you know, things that we like to think that were different in these days, but mm, perhaps not. Who knows? Anyhow, um, he applied his perspective. Now, he wasn't alone. It, it, you know, in science, we uh, one of the things about science is that you have critics, and in doing so, you have to 
you have to get used to it and, and not to take it personal. And I've been through it myself. I just I found something new, and it stepped on the the work of others that had been doing it most of their career. Not that I'm anything special. Is I just observed something and I studied it, and it turned out uh, that uh, it it's, it, it uh, showed that maybe it wasn't a viral a virus didn't cause a disease, and boy, it uh, it was painful. And what, based on that experience, I can understand what Charles Darwin was going through. And if you look at some of the individuals, uh, the, the Leclerc, uh, Cuvier, Baptiste Lamarck, and uh, this Lyell, uh, these individuals all had their personalities. Some of them were ruthless. Some of them wanted to uh, uh, steal ideas. Some of them, uh, way before Charles Darwin times, came up with interesting ideas, uh, similar, uh, but um, they all contribute. Uh, one of the statements, I think, Sir Isaac Newton said that new discoveries were built on the shoulders of others. And here's an a, a, a perfect case for that, that the Char Charles Darwin built on the influences of various others. Uh, geological uh, influences that the crust of the earth changed and it forces some of the new things. Now, the reason I bring that up is that a lot of the philosophy says it everything is the way it was supposed to be and you don't question it. Well, he questioned it. And, um, and I think all of these things are put in motion uh, and I don't think it's a random process, but that's just me. Um, so uh, uh, Darwin's whole point uh, of this time was that he brought into question, and um, and it's and it's fine uh, to question things, and you shouldn't uh, uh, be put down for that sort of thing. And uh, well, let me show you one of the ideas. 17, 1800s, uh, the French naturalist uh, Leclerc uh, calculated the Earth must be about 75,000 years old. And um, it was the minimum time to cool. Now, a lot of these would be uh, taken from uh, the religious community. And uh, the idea is that you question some of the sacred truths and in the time uh, the church and religious communities uh, would would resent that and why would you dare question these sorts of things and, and we still see that today which is fine it's all part of the process and um, Charles Lyell 1830 book principles of geology this was the one that there was constantly reshaping of the earth and the, the concept is that if, if you want to put it in a religious framework, um, God must have put things in motion and for them to change. Or it's a natural process is change. However you want to look at it, um, all of these uh, things uh, can be contemplated in this, in this concept. So living species gradually change over time. And Covier, uh, discovered fossils and so uh, as you saw in the movie it influenced uh, uh, Darwin uh, from the, the concept that things were much larger and but they re resembled some of the current forms of life and that really set uh, Charles Darwin uh, sort of on his quest or his motion now to explain some of these things and uh, although Cuvier was not a proponent of the idea of evolution, uh, what he did is that he found fossils that allowed um, this concept of change in, in the fossil record and also that extinction occurred. Uh, some species just no longer existed. And so these uh, were earth-shattering concepts at the time and we take it ho-hum attitude today but in light of uh, the way things were so that's why the movie was important is to kind of give you the framework at which some of the scientists were uh, and, and what they had to, to overcome so the idea the Covier was uh, fossils and the idea that things changed 
and he published it. And uh, this really kind of broke the ice in, the, in sort of the thinking of that time. And a lot of the beliefs were held that the earth is only 6,000 years old. And the Bible makes reference to that. But uh, one of the things that if you look at uh, other millennial and millennium uh, periods of time in the Bible, a day is a thousand years um, long, maybe 6,000 times a thousand. Uh, it kind of comes uh, around to what uh, Lyell was saying. But uh, it, 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 irregardless of that, uh, we, we notice that uh, Charles Darwin had changed some of the thinking. Uh, Darwin was born in 1809, just a few days before uh, my birthday. And he went to Edinburgh Medical School and he studied theology, which you know, you think about it, it sounds strange, but uh, I have a, a doctorate's degree. I have a, a, a doctorate's degree in philosophy. That's what a PhD is. So things haven't changed. Now, I didn't major in philosophy, but what it is is a philosophy about the science, which I chose was microbiology. So uh, I have a doctorate's degree in the philosophy of what microbiologists do and, and how they study and that sort of thing. And that's the way uh, Charles Darwin uh, was. It, it, it's a philosophy in how to study. And, and that's what my hope is for uh, all of my students, is to arm you with the ability now uh, to, to learn, pull things together. You don't need me. You can do the learning and those explorations on your own. Uh, but the concept is you learn how to learn, learn how to think, and then you can apply and you can do anything you want. It, it's just, A, you got to have a desire and something to uh, light your fire, that is something you really enjoy doing. And in this case, uh, let me share with you, I'll uh, come back to this one, that uh, he really enjoyed or loved, um, where was that, I guess missed it oh he, his love was of nature and and so because of that and he had chosen uh, to do uh, travels with the captain on the HH, HMS uh, Her Majesty's ship uh, Bagel in 1831 and you can look at this this traveling now you wouldn't uh, I can imagine the rough seas and things that, that went on but they, they traveled around but the famous one is the Galapagos Islands uh, tour and this is really, really interesting uh, what he found in these pristine little islands and had uh, different birds that were there. And I'm actually uh, working on a project uh, and I've, I've obtained a collection of bird beaks that have been scanned uh, from this university in the UK. And they gave me their entire collection so I have all these scanned beaks, and what I want to do is to print certain beaks that would uh, represent the uh, Charles Darwin's Galapagos Island experience, but just model the bird beaks and showing the differences in the beak structure allowed them to forage in various different foods, which we're going to talk about, and then how that allowed them to compete within the same environment because they went after different foods and food stuff. And uh, that was important, and I, I, that's something that uh, Charles Darwin gave to us as part of his work. Um, so he uh, learned how to study, he learned how to be a professional, and, but it wasn't his thing, and so nature turned out to be really what he wanted to do. And uh, his first love, of course, uh, or his, his real love was the study of uh, nature and that tour uh, with the US uh, HMS Beagle allowed him to do that and uh, he of course I, and I imagine I'd be the same way uh, um, I've done some deep sea fishing and my brother's a fisherman and I was younger at the time but we get out those high seas and boy I'd spend most of my time staring at the water uh, overboard, contributing and feeding the fish, if you know what I mean. And um, so big uh, ocean tours and seas don't sit with me very well, and they never have. And although um, it's one of the reasons why I like scuba diving, once I get in the water, especially rough water, 
uh, seasickness goes away immediately. Now, I almost drowned when I was a kid, so um, swimming, I, I don't know how to swim. Yet, um, I know I, I'm trained as a master diver, and I can dive and do all sorts of things. Um, so it was a challenge doing the doggy paddle um, to get through the certification. But anyhow, lest I digress, uh, but the idea was uh, I love exploring the ocean and various different uh, aspects of sea life. And this, I could understand why uh, Charles Darwin enjoyed what he did. And um, anyhow, uh, he explored beaches, cliffs, finding spectacular fossils in Patagonia. Uh, he he star studied the coral reefs and barnacles. And he was just very, very observant. And the thing is that when you do these sorts of things, it kind of sticks in your mind. And then subconsciously, or however you want to think of it, he was just trying to rationalize how does all these things fit together. So if you look at the islands, the Galapagos Islands, and they're isolated from each other, yet they had different types of populations of birds. And you would think that they all would have the same, but they don't. And the food supplies are slightly different in uh, each of the islands. And the, it seems like each of these islands represents sort of a, a unique little evolution um, I don't know, model that went on. And you saw various uh, things with the birds. And what a fascinating type of uh, discovery that he made. And so he was intrigued with the, the, the variety of birds mostly finches and that's what I wanted to do is to model the uh, bird beaks uh, the various finches so uh, we'll set this sort of um, all these bird beak models up printed 3d models at the museum and uh, we'll donate them or uh, at least present that during Darwin Day uh, hopefully next year uh, we can get this project done if you're interested in those sorts of things just let me know um, assuming that we will ever get back to uh, the STEM Center over at Wake Tech, but we'll see. So what Darwin observed uh, was unexpected patterns, and what he did is he looked at physical traits, and because each island had different finches, now as you saw in the movie, and to my shock really, is that he didn't write down which birds from which island and that sort of thing had traits, and I thought that was an important, although he observed it, uh, I kind of view that as a little bit of, of laziness. Uh, if you uh, think about some of the other work that we saw where Gregor Mendel went around, he took meticulous notes. And Charles Darwin learned that, well, we, we need to take those notes and, and make those distinctions. And uh, that way, uh, his note-taking got better. And it, that actually, although the movie didn't say it much, but I, I read into the fact and some of the, the texts that I've read about Darwin is that that actually kind of uh, hurt him in terms of getting things out timely. Although you saw in the movie um, some of the pressures that he was under in terms of maybe sitting on his um, information because it was so revolutionary at the time. Um, so Darwin collected and donated finch specimens to the Zoological Society of London, which a good scientist should always do. You want to share your data, so when you make conclusions, comments, and various things, it, you're building support and people to independently uh, confirm your notions, and that, that's all part of the sciences. Uh, so what he looked at was body size, beak shape, and feather colors, and various uh, finches, um, and believe it or not, uh, what he found were unique lineages on each island that uh, he traveled. And birds were 14 different species, all resembling very closely the single species of finch. And this must have really shook uh, Charles Darwin. So you can see, here's a rather cruddy um, image, as it's best I could do. I can't draw a stick figure. And so this was sort of the, I, I took this lithography off of a uh, older textbook. And you can see, look at the bird beaks and how they're different. Look at the, the, the plumage and, and just the overall power of the beak versus some of the other ones that are really small. And uh, very interesting. Um, Charles Darwin was able to study the natural world. 
and um, I know that uh, Darwin gets my dog all excited every time I bring up his name. You probably can hear him in the background. Um, anyhow, that, his comments hopefully will, will be concluding soon. Um, Darwin noted unexpected patterns and he looked at the fossil records. And what he did is that they resembled but were not identical to the ones he knew or could see in the same area. So all of these things are starting to fit together as a puzzle uh, that uh, he could now write a story about. And so that trip on the uh, HMS uh, Beagle really uh, came up with this uh, concept uh, of, S he wrote it about it called the essay on the principle of population uh, that Thomas uh, Matthews uh, wrote, calculated populations from various things. Um, and again, the work, uh, new work is always built on the shoulders of others. So based on this essay, um, made him think about um, the idea that individuals would win in the ensuing struggle for existence. And so they, uh, it's the survival of the fittest is really what this is uh, coming to. And again, the essay on the principle of population by Malthus, uh, 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 helped him to kind of jump that uh, little schism there from previous thought now to new thinking. Um, and so here is um, Amatha's books. Um, and it's always fun to look these up. Uh, I have Darwin's uh, notes and things that are available. You can just look on the web and you can see it in his own handwriting, uh, various uh, notes and things, which is kind of cool. Um, and so if you look at uh, Charles Darwin's favorable variations would, uh, would tend to be preserved and unfavorable ones would be destroyed. Uh, this was the, the, the real context of uh, his work. And uh, Darwin prepared a draft of his ideas in a 35 page paper written in pencil. And again, here's in his own hand, you can see, and he fleshed out over the next couple of years and uh, this was sort of the precursor to his uh, famous book. So hopefully um, uh, you took advantage and looked at uh, just the first part. Now if you want to watch all seven parts, there are seven parts to this movie. Uh, part one is, is sufficient for communicating what I uh, was really um, after. And I, uh, hopefully you'll get a chance to do that if you haven't already. And so Darwin on the origin of species, which is the landmark, and and I like this slide from the standpoint because what it does is it looks at uh, all organisms were put on Earth by a creator at the same time. Uh, organisms are fixed, no additions, no subtractions. Earth is about 6,000 years old and the Earth is mostly unchanging. So these were the precepts of the thinking at the time and after that uh, Darwin found that organisms change over time and uh, of course you can still uh, put it in context but uh, it, it's, it's good enough uh, just to, to draw the conclusions. Some organisms have gone extinct. The earth is more than 6,000 years old and the geology of the earth is not constant but always changing. And these were really landmarking um, uh, discoveries. So after putting off publishing his thoughts, because he thought, as you saw in the movie, would be, just be too radical, and he worried about the negative impact it would have on his family and his wife and all that. Um, Darwin finally did because uh, Alfred Wallace, who was his nemesis and competitor, came up with the same idea. And this happens a lot. Uh, I've experienced what it's like to get scooped you know, I'm doing something and I spent a lot of time and then somebody else beats you to the punch and getting it out there and publishing. Um, and it's, it's, it, it could be pretty upsetting um, because then it kind of takes the thunder out of some of your discoveries and things. But that's, that's all horse racing there. That's all part of it. So evolution occurs with an allele frequency. Now, if you remember what alleles are, there's sort of a change up on a particular trait. 
and so you may have a trait for a particular eye color and another or hair color or whatever and you have a slightly different allele that may represent um, some other characteristic and so this was a new and if a, a particular allele is uh, or a alternate phenotype or characteristic that now allows them to compete better uh, you would expect those genes to now become more uh, popular or uh, be more uh, evident in the population if it is in fact being selected for so one way to look at that is that it increases the allelic frequency in other words the frequency of the new genes that give the characteristics or the variation of of a gene as as an allele uh, states um, an allele's market share changes evolution is taking place and the the factors that drive uh, evolution are mutation genetic drift migration and natural selection and we're going to spend uh, the rest of this particular uh, presentation going over these things and but all of these things contribute to improving its ability now to get it out there if there are advantages that allows them to compete or out compete uh, then these are the things that contribute uh, to those successes and getting it there so evolution is a change in allelic frequency within a population and there's certain things that can drive that mutation genetic drift migration natural selection which we're going to talk about mutation is a direct change in dna as we've, we've already talked about see as we go through various classes it it hopefully builds on itself so you can see now uh, how this actually evolves in terms of oh, that was a pun sorry about that it's how it it uh, tells us evolutions to change in allelic frequency based on mutations or altered alterations of these um, um, alleles making them alleles and so we've talked about that so mutation or random can't predict ahead of time uh, they occur they may be silent they don't do anything so in in our families the, the scientists say that we get about three mutations per generation a lot of them you never hear about some of them uh, may uh, be beneficial some of them may not be um, but they are random and they are uh, what they are either harmful useful or whatever or if not even see them so um, mutations either do not impact fitness now we're going to talk about what fitness is but it's its ability to compete and uh, to be on top in other words being able to forage for food and do all the life nece necessary things and you have the genetics that support that um, or some of these mutations um, may cause early death um, or actually uh, cut down on the reproductive uh, success for whatever reason so there's a, it's a mishmash of things that can happen so mutation is the alteration of the DNA these alterations may be uh, something that causes change some of it may not uh, but it is what drives uh, ultimately the changes that we see uh, genetic drift is a random change in the allele frequencies in a population and if it's advantageous then this drift can lead to fixation and what that means is it uh, it's an allele's frequency in a population that ultimately fixes or it reaches a hundred percent and you can see the fixation occurring here in this diagram it starts and then it becomes the you know unless you have these characteristics it's not going to happen for you and so uh, you're just not um, going to be competitive enough and that's what fixation is uh, its ability to uh, be very competitive really and uh, in a very positive way the founder effect is another genetic drift concept uh, genetic drift occurs via the founder effect when a founder member of a new population has a different allelic frequency than the original source uh, so they now are breaking away and form their own newly founded population uh, and then 
that founder effect will bring those characteristics genetically to bear and uh, then we start to see uh, the new uh, characteristics being uh, brought forth and um, so um, genetic drift the bottleneck effect now genetic drift occurs via a bottleneck effect just like the bottleneck is what they're referring to um, when there's a famine disease or some rapid environmental change like the coronavirus I guess um, deaths of a large random pop, uh, portion of the population surviving individuals have different allelic frequencies and so everything had to kind of go through that change and that's what the bottleneck comes from uh, so when you shake the bottle a certain number of characteristics will emerge and if that is what's starting or uh, is being left now for the new uh, community then that's going to be the representative and that's called the bottleneck uh, population or the bottleneck effect pretty straightforward well, common sense stuff of course they have to have a nice fancy name for it so just to state it again some sort of famine or disease or rapid environmental change causes the population uh, to reduce to a smaller f fraction of its original and it'll have unique sort of characteristics of allelic uh, background and that's what persists and we call that the founder effect and I mean the bottle the bottleneck effect and, uh, and so uh, the take-home message and just to summarize and I'll, I will be stopping at this section here genetic drift is a random change in allelic frequencies within a population and these uh, you know, alleles influence the reproductive success could be positive could be negative genetic drift is a significant mechanism of evolutionary change and so what you do is you just have a population of alleles that contributes to whatever characteristics and if they're uh, advantageous for the organism then those are the ones that uh, predominate and you'll see that uh, more and more and that's um, uh, where we're going to stop uh, well pick up on is going into gene flow and migration and uh, those concepts so um, again uh, review the uh, the Darwin movie I think that really uh, is good I have a worksheet that goes along with that so you can just kind of take notes as it, uh, it occurs the questions are in order and uh, some of the concepts are applied to virology and some of the other things and uh, I like the deviations that occur during the movie to kind of give you an insight as to what uh, field works like and that sort of thing. So I hope you enjoyed that and um, we'll pick up next time. Uh, I'll try to get the, the other half uh, of this video out uh, this week. And uh, thank you and I'll see you next time.